Section 10 of Astounding Stories 11, November 1930. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Destroyer by William Merriam. Part 2. At last Parker did sleep, to awake shortly after daylight. He got a hasty breakfast and took an early train to New York. When John Cartwright, a shrewd and kindly man, well advanced in years, arrived at his office, Alan Parker was right there waiting for him. Cartwright had shown a real affection for the younger man, a paternal interest. He beamed, as usual, until he sat down with the new drawings. Slowly the smile faded from his face. He went over them twice, three times, and then he looked up. "'My boy,' he said, "'did you do these?' "'Yes. Do you know that you are turning a delicate and beautiful romance into a lascivious libel on the human race?' "'It is being done,' replied Parker, in a low voice, "'and I—I I can't help myself.' "'What do you mean by that?' "'I mean that when I start to draw Madeline, my hand produces that woman of Babylon. The writing is just as bad. It's full of sneering hints, double meanings. I shall destroy the stuff. I've been to see a psychoanalyst.' "'Ah!' thoughtfully. "'Perhaps you're tired, Alan. Why not take Betty for a sea trip?' There'll still be time for fall publication. I'm going to try everything possible. I'd rather be dead than do work like this. When Parker left his friend he was somewhat encouraged. After the first shock, Cartwright had been inclined to make light of the difficulty, and by the time Alan Parker reached Pine Hills his stride had the usual swing and snap. He ran up the steps of his house and burst into the living room with a smile. Betty was sitting by one of the windows her hands lying relaxed in her lap. She turned a somber face toward her husband, and spoke before he had time to say a word of greeting. "'You knew that Cordelia Lyman died a short time ago, didn't you?' "'What's that?' exclaimed Parker, bewildered. "'Lyman? Oh, the old lady down the street who left her money to found a home for aged spinsters. What about it?' "'But she didn't leave her money to found a home for aged spinsters, Alan.' She had said she was going to, and everybody thought so. Her will was admitted to probate, or whatever they call it, yesterday. She left half a million, all she had, to Dr. Friedrich von Stein, to be used as he thinks best for the advancement of science. Good heavens! Parker stared. Why didn't I know she knew him? He'd only been here a week or so when she died. There isn't a flaw in the will, they say. You can imagine that Pine Hills is talking. Well, said Parker philosophically, he's lucky. I hope he does something with it. He will, replied Betty with conviction. He'll do a great many things. Parker told her of his interview with Cartwright, but she seemed little interested. He did not try to work that day, but after he had put the offending drawings and manuscript out of sight, he wandered, read, smoked, and in the evening persuaded Betty to take a moonlight walk with him. They passed the house of Dr. von Stein, from which came a faint humming that sounded like a dynamo. Across the street the church was alight for some service. Triumphant music drifted to them. The moon hung above the spire, with its cross outlined darkly against the brilliant sky. The windows were great jewels. Betty drew a deep breath. "'Sometimes, Alan,' she said, "'I feel like praying.' "'You are a beautiful prayer,' whispered Parker. She walked close to him, holding his arm, and repeated softly, "'Are not two prayers a perfect strength? And shall I feel afraid?' But that was the end of that mood. By the time they arrived home, Betty was again the strange, aloof, cold, slightly hard woman of the past few days. Again depression settled upon Alan Parker. The next morning he breakfasted alone and went directly to the studio without seeing Betty. Sun streamed into the room. The pencil moved swiftly. For a brief time Parker thought he was himself again, as Madeline grew upon the block of paper. But the end was terrible. The last few strokes made her grotesque. This time the woman he had drawn was not merely evil. She was a mocking parody of his heroine. He threw drawing and pencil across the room. But no real artist can be discouraged short of death. He went to work again and labored until luncheon time. The results were no better, although they varied. Now it seemed that some malevolent power was playing with him, torturing him to the accompaniment of devilish laughter. He was haggard, and actually stooped of body when he bathed his face and went down to the dining-room. 
From across the table, Betty regarded him curiously. "'Fleming Proctor shot himself last night,' she announced calmly. "'This morning they found him dead in his office.' "'Proctor? You don't mean the president of the Pine Hills National Bank?' "'Yes.' The expression of Betty's face did not change. There was a note saying that he was sorry. It seems he'd made a large loan without security to an unknown person, and the bank examiner was coming today. Proctor said he couldn't help what he did. The note was confused, as though he were trying to tell something and couldn't. They think his mind must have given way, particularly as they can't trace the loan, although the money is undoubtedly gone. That kind of thing doesn't happen. Parker was stunned. He had known Fleming Proctor and liked him. They met often at the country club. Proctor was honest and a fine business man. It did happen, Ellen. I'd like to know more about it. That would have been a case for Dr. Von Stein to take in hand. Perhaps, said Betty in a voice like ice, but I'm more interested in finding out how soon you are going to return to normal. Frankly, I'm beginning to get bored. Without a word, Parker rose and left the room. Never before had his wife hurt him like this. Doubly sensitive just now, he was suffering alone in the studio when the telephone rang. Dr. Von Stein speaking. Are you better, Mr. Parker? Worse, much worse. Then come to my house this evening at nine. May I expect you? And alone? Yes. There was much Parker wanted to say, but he choked the words back. I'll be there, and alone. I shall be ready for you. Good-bye. Alan Parker hung up the receiver. He did not leave the studio again until evening. As Parker approached the house of Dr. Friedrich von Stein, he saw that the church was lighted as it had been the night before. In a clear sky the moon rode above the spire. He paused to let his glance sweep up along the beautiful line that ran from earth to the slender cross. That was how he felt. He wanted to rise as that line rose from cumbering earth to clarity and beauty. He mounted the steps and rang. Dr. von Stein met him, with eyes and teeth agleam in the hall light. Wearily, Parker stepped inside. His mood of the moment before was fading. "'Go upstairs to my laboratory, if you please,' said the doctor. "'It is best that I see you there, for it may be that you will need treatment.' "'I need something,' replied Parker, as he went up a long flight of stairs. "'I'm in a bad way.' Without answer, von Stein led him down a short corridor and held open a door. Alan Parker stepped into a room that bewildered him with its strange contrasts. At a glance he saw that nearly the whole upper floor of the building had been converted into one gigantic room. Near a big stone fireplace, where burning driftwood sent up its many tinted flames, Heinrich stood rigidly at attention. Hans, the dachshund, crouched at his feet. When the dog started to meet Parker, a guttural command stopped him. Here there were bearskins on the floor, huge stuffed chairs, footrests, little tables, humidors, pipe racks, all that one could desire for comfort. Two German dueling swords were crossed above the mantel. But beyond this corner everything was different. Parker saw the massed windows of reddish-purple glass. He saw apparatus for which he had no name, as well as some of the ordinary paraphernalia of the chemical laboratory. There was wiring everywhere, and a multitude of lighting fixtures. Utilitarian tables, desks, and chairs were placed about with mathematical precision. There were plates and strips of metal set into the glass-smooth flooring, which was broken by depressions and elevations of unusual form. The most striking thing in the room was a huge copper bowl that hung inverted from the ceiling. In it, and extending down below the rim, was what seemed to be a thick and stationary mist. It looked as though the bowl had been filled with a silver-gray mist, and then turned bottom side up, but the cloud did not fall or float away. "'I can think and speak best from my desk,' von Stein was saying. "'Please sit down, facing me in the chair which Heinrich will place for you. Then we will talk.' Heinrich rolled one of the overstuffed chairs noiselessly to a position about six feet from the desk. Parker noticed a long metal strip in the floor between him and the doctor. Just then Hans wriggled forward, and the artist scratched his ears to be rewarded by a grateful tongue. Again a command from Heinrich brought the dog to heel, but the voice was not so gruff this time. Together they returned to the fireplace. 
Von Stein let his hands rest upon the desktop. A surface covered with levers, electric switches, push-buttons, and contrivances the nature of which Parker could not guess. The doctor leaned forward. He threw over a switch. The lights in the room became less bright. He pressed a button. The danse macabre of Sansen floated weirdly upon the air, as though the music came from afar off. "'Is that part of the treatment?' asked Parker, with a faint smile. "'It's not cheering, exactly.' "'Merely an idiosyncrasy of mine,' answered von Stein, showing his teeth. "'Before anything is done, I must, in order to aid the receptivity of your mind, go a little further with the explanation of certain things which I mentioned the other day. I promise not to bore you. More than that, Mr. Parker, I promise that you will be more interested than you have ever been in anything.' It seemed to Parker that there was something sinister in the manner and speech of Dr. von Stein. The dance of death. Did that music have a meaning? Impossible. It was only his own sick mind that was allowing such thoughts to come to him. "'Anything that will help,' he murmured. "'You have noticed the copper bowl?' Von Stein did not wait for a reply. "'The misty appearance inside and underneath it is given by thousands upon thousands of minute platinum wires. When it is in use, a slight electrical current is passed through it, varying in power according to the rate of vibration needed. That instrument, my dear sir, is a transmitter of thought. I may call it the microphone of the mind. I can tune in on any mind in the world by experimenting up and down the vibration range to determine the susceptibility of the particular person. The human mind does not need an amplifier, as the radio receiving set does. Rather, it acts as its own amplifier, once having received the thought. I invented one, however, to prove that it could be done. I equipped Heinrich with it, and in half an hour, by suggestion, reduced him to his present state of docile stupidity. I have, Mr. Parker, the means of moving people to do my bidding." Von Stein stopped abruptly, as though for emphasis and to allow his astounding statements to take effect. Parker sat stunned, struggling to grasp all the implications of what he had just heard. Suddenly they became clear. He saw events in order and in relation to each other. "'So that's how it was with Cordelia Lyman,' he cried hoarsely, leaning forward. "'And it was you who had that money from Fleming Proctor.' "'You are not unintelligent,' remarked Dr. von Stein. "'Better that science should have the Lyman money than a few old women of no particular use. As for Proctor, he was a fool. I would have protected him.' "'And my pictures. My book. I can cure you, Mr. Parker, if I will. And anyone is at the mercy of this man,' groaned Parker. "'Not absolutely, I'm sorry to say,' said the doctor. The action of thought on the human consciousness is exactly like that of sound on the tuning fork. When the mind is tuned right, we'll say for illustration the lower vibrations are not picked up out of the ether. But as few minds are tuned right, and as all vary from time to time, I'm practically omnipotent. You have changed the nature of my wife. Parker was getting hold of himself, and he could speak with a degree of calmness. That is a worse crime than the one you've committed against me directly. Mr. Parker, said the doctor impressively, you are in a web. I am the spider, you are the fly. I don't particularly desire to hurt you, but I want your wife. This is the crux of the matter. She is the woman to share my triumphs. Already I have aroused her interest. Give her up, and you will continue your work as before. Refuse and you will lose her just as certainly as though you give her to me. For, my dear sir, you will be insane in less than a month from now. I promise you that." Ellen Parker was not one to indulge in melodrama. For a long moment he sat looking into the black eyes of von Stein. Then he spoke carefully. "'If my wife of her own will loved you and wanted freedom, I'd let her go. But this is a kind of hypnosis. It's diabolical. "'Who but the devil was the father of magic?' asked the doctor cheerfully. "'Hypnosis is unconsciously based on a scientific principle which I have mastered. Repeated advertising of a toothbrush or a box of crackers is mild mental suggestion. Hypnosis, if you will. My dear fellow, be sensible.' 
Sophistry, growled Parker. Von Stein laughed. He moved a lever upon a dial, and a sheet of blue flame quivered between them. With another movement of the lever, it vanished. I could destroy you instantly, he said, and completely, and no one could prove a crime. I shall not do it. I have no time to be bothered with investigations. Think of the fate I have promised you. Think, and you will give her up. I shall not. Parker wiped cold drops from his forehead. The doctor frowned thoughtfully. I'll intensify her desire to come here tonight, he said. She, herself, will persuade you. Parker set his fingers into the arms of his chair as von Stein rose and walked to the copper bowl. He stood directly under it and put on goggles with shields fitting close to his feet. At the pressure of his foot, a table-like affair rose from the floor in front of him. This, like the desk, was equipped with numerous dials, buttons, and levers. Von Stein manipulated them. The great cap of copper descended until his head was enveloped by the mist of platinum wires. A faint humming grew in the room. A tiny bell tinkled. "'The connection is made,' murmured von Stein. He lifted a hand for silence. Then his fingers leaped among the gadgets on the table. After that came a brief period measured by seconds of immobility. Then the table sank from view, the copper bowl lifted, and Dr. von Stein went back to his chair. "'She will be here shortly,' he said. "'If that does not change your mind?' He shrugged. Parker knew what that shrug meant. He searched his mind for a plan and found none. Better die fighting than yield, or risk the vengeance of Friedrich von Stein. If he could get the doctor away from the desk where he controlled the blue-white flame, there might be a chance to do something. Von Stein was by far the larger man. But Parker had been an athlete all his life. If that mass of copper and platinum, he said tentatively, will make you master of the world. My brain, my intelligence, has made me master of the world, corrected von Stein proudly. He was touched in the right spot now. You have not seen all. He sprang up and went to one of the tables. From his pocket he took a piece of paper and crumpled it into a ball, while with the other hand he made some electrical connections to a plate of metal set into the surface of the table. Next he placed the wad of paper on the plate. Then, standing at arm's length from the apparatus, he pressed a button. Instantly the paper disappeared behind a screen of the colors of the spectrum from red to violet. The banded colors were there for a minute fraction of a second. Then there was nothing where the paper had been on the plate. Von Stein smiled as he stepped away from the table. The electron is formed by the crossing of two lines of force, he said, and the interaction of positive and negative polarity. The electron is a stress in the ether, nothing more, but it is the stuff of which all matter is made. Thought is vibration in one dimension, matter in two. You have just seen me untie the knot, dissociate the electrons, or what you will. In plain language, I have caused matter to vanish utterly. That paper is not burned up. It no longer exists in any form. The earth upon which we stand, Parker, can be dissolved like mist before the sun. Appalled as he was at this man who boasted and made good his terrible boasts, Alan Parker had not forgotten the purpose that was in him. Now was his chance, while von Stein stood smiling triumphantly between table and desk. Parker shot from his chair with a speed of utter desperation. He fainted and drove a vicious uppercut to the jaw of Dr. Friedrich von Stein. The doctor reeled, but he did not go down. His fists swung. Parker found him no boxer, and beat a tattoo upon his middle. Von Stein began to slump. Then two thick muscled arms closed around the artist from behind, and he was lifted clear of the floor. He kicked and tried to turn, but it was useless. The doctor recovered himself. His eyes blazed fury. "'Put him in the chair, Heinrich,' he roared. "'For this I will show you what I can do, Herr Parker.' At that instant, little Hans, who had been yelping on the edge of the battle, dashed in. He leaped for the throat of von Stein. The doctor kicked him brutally. The shriek of agony from Hans loosened the arms of Heinrich. Parker got his footing again. He saw the clumsy serving man spring forward and gather his dog up to his breast. Again Parker rushed for his enemy. It was clear now that von Stein was cut off from the controls he wanted, and without Heinrich he could not master Parker in a fight. 
For an instant he stood baffled. Then he retreated the length of the room, taking what blows he could not beat off. He staggered upon a plate of metal set into the floor, righted himself, and failed in an attempt to catch hold of Parker. Suddenly he bowed in the direction of the distant doorway. Allen half turned. Betty was coming down the room, staring and breathless. "'Lieben Sie wohl,' cried von Stein. "'Farewell, madam. I should like to take you with me.' A great flash of the colors of the spectrum sent Parker reeling back. Dr. Friedrich von Stein had gone the way of the crumpled ball of paper. There was a long moment of silence. Then Alan Parker found his wife in his arms, clinging to him. "'Are not two prayers a perfect strength?' she murmured, sobbing against his heart. End of Part 2 And End of the Destroyer by William Merriam